Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Accelerated ID series. My name is Katie Short, and I'm the Director of Learning Solutions at the Instructional Design Company, and we're so happy to have you on today for another episode and another tutorial and walkthrough uh, to help you get more comfortable and just kind of get some more exposure to some instructional design principles, um, tools, any kind of resources. That's our goal is to really supply you with some more experience with those things and to just hear from other people that are using them. And so I'm really excited. Today, we're going to be talking about video tutorials, um, getting into the do's and the don'ts and the benefits and how you can really use them to your best advantage um, as an instructional designer. And I'm so happy to have an, our other team member, and I'm so glad that she's going to join us today in the, in the hot seat. Um, it is Sarah. I'm so glad to have you. So I want to give everyone a chance to get to know you. Uh, so tell us a little about your background and how you got into instructional design. Sure. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I started off as a teacher. I was a teacher for 10 years. And while I was looking into master's programs, I discovered instructional design and I was kind of like, why have I never heard of this before? It seems like such a good path. Um, and so that was the path that I chose. And here I am. Um, I quit my full-time teaching job. So I've been a full-time freelance instructional designer um, for just over a year now. Awesome. Awesome. And that's, I feel so um like, you know, you feel kind of camaraderie in that. That's definitely how I felt too. I had no idea about instructional design and this was such a, I didn't know it existed. And it was like, well, duh, this is such an easy choice uh, to jump into. So we're so glad to have you today to provide your experience and how things are going and also to let us know about video tutorials. Today, I've got kind of all my tried and true tri uh, tips, things that I've continued to do, put into practice um, that I want to share with you today. So uh, just to kind of let you know what you can expect, I've got three main things I'm going to cover today. Uh, I'll start off by kind of telling you, making sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to what I mean by video tutorial. Uh, and then I'll also explain what the benefits are of using them as a training tool. Um, and then mainly what I'm going to focus on is the do's and don'ts, the uh, all the little things that you should, should not do in a video tutorial that add up to this one really professional polished video. Um, I do want to call out at this point that everything that I have for you today, um, it's meant for a really broad audience or a, like a broad range of experience levels. And I'm also not going to focus on any specific development tools. So please don't feel like uh, you need to have access to expensive video editing uh, software. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to share with you, I've got five steps to create a video tutorial as a portfolio asset. Basically, the main purpose of a video tutorial is for your audience to see a process in action, something that's necessary to their workflow, something they have to do using a website or uh, software and application. I'm really going to use those three words interchangeably today. Something um, on a computer um, in action before they navigate it in real life. And a couple of key points and things that I highlighted on screen is employees have to complete this process. It's part of their workflow. It's something that like maybe can't move on with their, their normal work if they don't complete this, even if it's, if it's a very small process. It's not optional. And uh, additionally, companies invest a significant amount of money into the software or applications typically. So they're highly motivated to make sure that the software is used, first of all, and that it's used correctly. And then one other kind of important thing to point out is that a video tutorial itself is typically going to be part of a larger training solution that's got background info and practice opportunities. So you'll kind of see that as I take you through some of these next examples I have for you, that the video tutorial itself is like a small part of um, a larger training solution usually. So um, I've got a few examples. So now that you're thinking of video tutorials, these are all tutorials that I've developed in real life for clients. And you can see they've got kind of a broad uh, 
range of audiences. And now that you're looking at these examples, you might be thinking like, wait a second, how to check in a patient for an appointment? Like you've probably not done that before unless you have ever worked at the front desk of a doctor's office, but you've probably been checked in and you're like, that takes like 20 seconds. Well, let's take a step back first of all. And uh, remember that the video tutorial is one part of the training solution. So this video, how to check in a patient for an appointment, might have been the first step of several videos that were part of one module of this training, right? Um, but even though it's a very small process, a short process, think about how important it is. If you can't check in the patient for an appointment as a front desk worker, you probably also cannot access their chart or um, collect their copay. Um, in that office, if the patient isn't checked in correctly, the doctor's not going to see them. That's going to impact their day. You're also likely to have um, a frustrated customer, the patient, if the process takes too long. So even though this seems like such a small thing, um, it's really important and it's important that it's done correctly. So why would you as an instructional designer um, learn how to create video tutorials? Why is that a skill set that you want? Well, what I found is that there are really no shortage of opportunities to uh, create this type of training. Every company has processes that they have to follow that use software or an application or a website. Um, often they're adopting completely new software. So there's a huge training opportunity because everybody in the company that's going to use the software has to learn how to use it. Um, even if it's an established process, what about new hires? How do people that are new to the company learn how to use the software? Um, even for established processes, um, maybe the training, uh, maybe they they found that something is going wrong in the process, and that could be because the training wasn't done well in the first place. So maybe they're going back to the drawing board and uh, taking a look at how they're teaching everybody how to use the tools. For the client, a video tutorial allows them to really outline the most efficient and effective way to complete whatever the process is. So it kind of gives them the control of how they want their staff to use the tool. Uh, without a tutorial, a lot of companies rely on peer-to-peer -peer training. So, for example, if I am starting at a new company um, and I've never used this their software before, I might sit down with like Linda from accounting and she'll share with me how she has always done uh, whatever the process is and whatever the tool is. So the problem with that is it leaves a lot of room for error. Um, you want your processes to be standardized, especially if you've got different things happening from department to department. If you've got multiple branches, you want to make sure that the processes are the same. So this is something that I would pitch to clients as a reason why they should um, adopt video tutorials as a training method. A video tutorial will allow you to um, design a training that's more custom to each audience. So for example, the front desk staff can learn how to check in a patient, um, but the doctors don't have to sit through that training because they don't use that process. Um, the, the solution that I've seen more often than not is the company that's got this new software, they grab someone from the software company, it could be a developer, it could be a salesperson, and they have a huge Zoom meeting. And everybody that needs to learn the, the, the software is on the Zoom meeting, and the developer starts from the beginning and gives you all the information you could possibly want um, to hear about this software. And if you don't use the first couple things that the developer talks about, well, that's too bad. You have to sit and wait um, until we, they get to the part that applies to you in your department. We know as instructional designers, that's not the most effective way to train. The video tutorials takes the control back and you get to kind of create custom paths for different departments, custom paths, depending on like what each uh, audience needs to actually uh, use the software for. Obviously, you've got to consider your learner persona as you're designing your training. There's a couple things that are specific to video tutorials here. Um, when you're designing for a video tutorial, you might need to use technical language. Um, so think about your audience as you're thinking, like, should you refer to aspects of the software specifically? Are you calling something a checkbox or a radio button? Is it a menu or a ribbon? That kind of language. Um, consider your audience when you use specific things like that. Something else I kind of touched on in the last slide, but if you are designing training that's going to be, it has a really broad reach and different departments, different, like uh, different skill levels, you might consider being flexible in how you design the training. Um, maybe consider um, allowing 
your audience members who are more skilled in navigating new softwares skip like the introductory level uh, lessons. Don't lock everyone out of training unless they watch every single video so that your people that are more comfortable with like logging in and getting started in a new software can kind of skip those steps and, and uh, go to the, the more advanced steps. Um, another thing that's really important to do in a video tutorial is to navigate through the process yourself before you start writing anything. Um, I recommend regardless you set a meeting with a subject matter expert, that would be whoever is uh, familiar with the software. Sometimes it's a developer, usually that's what it is uh, in the work that I do. Set a meeting with them and if it's possible, uh, share your screen, you log in to that software, whatever it is, the app, and you have the subject matter expert give you instructions while you click through. That'll help you like be able to tell like, is this a click? Is it a double click? Things like that can be important. Sometimes as the instructional designer, though, you won't have access to uh, the, the software environment. In that case, still schedule that meeting with a subject matter expert, but have them walk through the meeting or walk through the software. Um, and regardless of who is going through the software, uh, record the meeting so you can watch it back later and take notes afterwards. Focus on what's going on on screen while you're in that meeting, um, but then watch it back and take notes because then you'll be able to ask some questions, some follow-up questions. You can ask the subject matter uh, expert questions about the functionality, and then you should also have somebody who's familiar with like the real use, the business use, who you can ask questions about how the audience is really gonna use it, because then um, you'll need to write your script. And I have on screen the formula that I usually follow when I'm writing a script. Um, and I'll give you kind of an example. So um, your introduction, remember your tutorial is probably part of a larger solution. So you shouldn't need to give a whole ton, like a, like a narrative explanation at the beginning of your tutorial. Here's an example of how I introduced that, how to share a Google folder um, video tutorial. So I said, in this tutorial, we'll walk through how to share a Google folder so you can get feedback on your challenge work and be entered to win a free seat in the instructional design and tech accelerator program. So I told them what they were going to do. I gave that learner obje learning objective and learner friendly language. And then I also got their buy in by explaining why it was beneficial for them to even pay attention to my video. The bulk of your script will be the, the process. What are the steps that your learners have to take? There'll be simple sentences starting with action verbs. I like to vary my language so it's not like click this, click that, click whatever. Um, but, you know, after you've written some scripts, read it back through, you'll kind of be able to see what works. And then simple conclusion, my example from the how to share a, a Google folder was now you know how to share a Google folder and you're ready to create a shared folder for your spring challenge work. Uh, just so that the video doesn't like end abruptly, um, like let them know, let your learner know where they're going next. Um, another good practice for any kind of training, but important not to skip. Uh, before you start developing, make sure that your subject matter expert, someone that's familiar with the functionality, and then your stakeholder, someone that's familiar with how it's going to be used in real life, uh, read that script before you do any recording or developing. Something that I want to draw your attention to is that your subject matter expert, so probably the developer, might have feedback that you don't end up putting into your final product. And the reason for that is your subject matter expert as most subject matter experts are, they are super familiar with everything that this software or whatever it is website can do. Um, you as the instructional designer know that you don't need all that information to be able to meet the learning objectives. Just something to consider as when you do get that feedback. Another thing that I recommend you stay away from unless it's absolutely necessary is explaining the user interface. So the things that you can see on screen out of context. I recommend instead you let the learners discover all those navigational aspects through a process instead of explaining it kind of out of context. Um, again, unless the interface, the, the way the screens look are just really brand new, unfamiliar, and your learners would get lost without an explanation, let them discover it on their own. Consider your primacy effect and uh, don't waste that prime learning time on an explanation that they will just discover on their own later. And then this is should be a given, but sometimes we don't always think about this, is you should not ever display sensitive information on screen. If you think about my example with the um, front desk staff at a doctor's office checking in a patient, um, I cannot use real patient data, real patient uh, addresses, 
social security numbers. There's a lot of sensitive data here that I need to make sure does not make it into the final product. And whether that's by creating a fake patient as I do this recording or whether it's editing that information out afterwards, I've got to make sure that I'm using all fake names, fake data, stuff like that. Um, and that kind of relates to my next don't, which is uh, you shouldn't include on screen distractors. And this is something that I really think sets a professional video tutorial apart from a more amateur screen share that really anyone could do. Um, when I say distractors, anything that's going to take your audience's attention away from the process that you're trying to explain and pull their attention to something that's on your screen that is, for whatever reason, distracting. So uh, when I said you should create fake data, make sure that that fake, that like the fake person, the fake data looks real. Developers love to use test as their uh, as their like dummy accounts or whatever. So we've got like Mr. Test Testerson who lives on one two three Test Street. That's fake data, but it's kind of distracting. Um, another thing I recommend staying away from, and I've seen this before, is using like character names uh, from movies or a TV show as your fake, uh, your fake data. Because maybe now instead of listening to the process, I am noticing that my patient's name is Hermione Granger. But wait, Hermione is spelled wrong. And huh, she lives in New York City. And oh, she is 112 years old. So your audience's eyes should just glaze over your fake data. They shouldn't know that it's fake. Uh, if you're using an account number, make sure that it's 10 numbers or whatever the account is in real life, uh, make it look real. Something else that I think happens a lot when we screen share in like a Zoom meeting or something and you wanna make sure it doesn't make it into your video tutorial is exaggerated mouse movement. So people tend to, when they're on a meeting and they're trying to draw your attention to something, be like, avoid exaggerated mouse movements. Um, but we really don't need that, uh, that motion to draw our attention to something. So just be conscious of that if you're recording a screen share. So I'm going to show you uh, kind of, this is like my I spy of don'ts. In my uh, video tutorial, how to share a Google folder, this screen would really be the backdrop for most of the time. I'm going to do some other things. I'll have to like show the audience how to click new and type in the name and all that. Um, but for the most part, everything you're seeing on my screen here is going to be seen um, by, by the, the end users. So um, some things that you might be that you might be noticing are that I have all of my uh, all of my files here visible. Um, I haven't done anything to to hide the file names here. And maybe instead of listening to, my presentation. Instead, the the learners are like, "Huh, oh, look at that! She was working on her on her uh, her tax deductions, uh, and it also looks like she submitted a job proposal for the instructional design company." Not super professional, right? So, like, do you really need to see that I was googling how to uh, how to make a video tutorial while I was preparing for a video tutorial event, right? You don't need to know that I was looking up a recipe for an iced mocha. Look at your environment ahead of time. Get rid of the things that you don't want to be that you don't want to uh, be seen on screen. So, I uh, just got one last tip for you. Um, this is more for if you are um, editing in like a video editor afterwards. Um, just because you can do something in a video edit editing tool, uh, especially with uh, with regards to a video tutorial doesn't mean that you should. Uh, and that's probably a good tip regardless of uh, what the training is, but be mindful of how you use effects like a Zoom. Um, you don't want your user, the audience, to get lost in the training environment. So if you do zoom in on a part of the screen to show, uh, you know, highlight something, try to zoom back out before you do any clicks. So there's no chance that your user, user will be wondering like, oh, wait, hang on, where are you now? Same thing with callouts or arrows. Use them mindfully and make sure that they're not covering up anything important. Um, you don't want to make it too hard for your learner to see uh, what's going on in the background. Okay, last but not least, I've got uh, five steps for you for how to create a video tutorial for your portfolio. First thing you want to do is choose a really short process that you're familiar with to demonstrate. So something that you have done before, so maybe something you do every day, what's something that you do as part of your work or uh, just personally on a website or an app, 
that you could explain uh, in a video tutorial. Something you have access to, not something that you would have to like pay to use or anything. Because the whole point of this is that we want to do this for free. Um, so then you've got your process, even if you're super familiar with it, still do that final walkthrough before you do any writing. Don't write your scripts because I guarantee you'll notice something about the website or the app that you might have skipped in your script and have to edit. Um, this will also give you, um, you, give you a chance to kind of look at the process from the perspective of a subject matter expert. You kind of have to be the subject matter expert um, and, and notice things about the functionality that you might need to include in your tutorial. And then like take that SME hat off and put the stakeholder hat on and now look at it from the perspective of the learner who is really going to be doing this. What's your learning objective? What sort of things do you have to include that will uh, be relevant to, to that learner? Um, and then you can uh, write your script. Uh, and you can follow that formula that I outlined a few slides ago. Practice the process. Uh, no matter how many times you've done it before, uh, practice before you hit record. If you don't, you'll end up recording and re-recording a million times. Um, when you practice, you'll uh, be able to kind of notice any of those distractors. So if there's anything on screen that you want hidden, you can get rid of that before you do your final recording and then like notice something halfway through and be like, oh no, okay, now I have to start over because I'm doing this for free. I'm not using a video editor. So I've got to just get it all in one. So practice, 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 uh, uh, figure out a good spot for to have a script so that you're able to read. If you have uh, another monitor, get your setup perfect before you do your last step, which is that final polished recording. Um, so I would recommend that you use a free tool like Screencastify. You could also use Zoom to record your screen and your audio at the same time. You could use a free video editing tool. If you have Windows 11, um, Movie Maker is a free video editor that if it's not already on your computer, you can download for free. If you're on a Mac, iMovie, I'm told, does a, same, a similar thing. Um, you can use that to make really simple cuts. Like if you have a little bit of extra, like clicking at the very beginning of the video, you could uh, snip that out. You could add like a title card if you wanted to. Just really basic editing um, if you want to. And those are all like those are free tools that that you could you could use to do that. Um, I recommend sending your finished product off to a friend, someone you trust, before uh, you upload it to YouTube or wherever you want to host your video, and then add it to your portfolio. And voila, you've got. A portfolio asset. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much uh, for letting us in on those things. So again, thanks everybody and come back again for our next episode.